but I'll also get to a quick introduction of myself. Uh, I've been in Mumbai, uh, last 20 years in the entertainment business, mostly music. Uh, started off in advertising, moved on with Rolling Stone magazine, uh, Wirecom 18, and Sony Music. That would be the highlights over the last 15 years. So I've seen the music industry from a media side of things as well as from sometimes even from the client side of things when you're dealing with clients um, as well. And by clients, I mean brands. Um, and for the last four years, I've been running my own agency since 2019, which is called Stubborn Company. Um, in my tenure with Sony Music, I was doing a lot of um, new business exploring for Sony Music. So there were new business opportunities like brand solutions, live music, like from a record label's point of view, it was still new business. It was new avenues of business. Um, so there was live music. There was, we had our own IPs. Um, and then we also delved into artist management. And uh, my last four years at Sony Music, which was from 2016 to 20, approximately, 2016 to 19, I worked with a lot of hip hop. Um, we'll, We'll get into that uh, a little later in this workshop as well. Uh, last Since 2019, uh, I manage my own agency and I run my own agency, which is partly artist management and partly um, an incubator uh, to work with artists to create more than just music with them. Uh, for example, if there is an artist where there is an opportunity to create a business around the artists and the artists work, uh, then that's where I step in and help them envision that. Um, since the last two years, Raphael and me have been working closely with uh, the European Music Exporters Exchange uh, on various um, objectives. It started as a research mission. Then there was a trade mission. That's when we met Marthon, which was uh, exactly a year ago now, Marthon. It was April last yeah. year. Yeah. And... Um, and uh, that was essentially to give them an idea about the Indian market, meet a lot of Indian executives, meet artists, visit concerts, visit venues, obviously eat a lot of Indian food along the way. Um, and uh, since the last year uh, is when Raphael and me have been actively working towards creating an Indian trade office, a music trade office, which does not exist as of right now in India. Um, so somewhere we are also inspired by the EME and Soundcheck and similar export offices that that work in different parts of Europe and the rest of the world as well. Um, and yeah, since since the last um, one year is when we started between Raphael and me, we started talking about it. And since the last eight months is when we started talking beyond just the two of us, uh, and we started speaking to people about it outside the country as well as with societies here. Raphael can tap more into that as well. Uh, do all kinds of trade bodies, uh, record labels, uh, and essentially creating a consortium of, um, of a, as a trade office for the Indian music industry. Um, Raf, do you want to just quickly tell them a little bit about yourself and maybe get on to those two slides? Yeah. Um, hi, everyone. I think uh, um, Sushil's mentioned how we met and uh, how we've come to be here, so I, I won't get into that. Uh, I'm uh, Rafael Pereira. Um, I'm a lawyer, entrepreneur in the music, media, and entertainment space uh, here in India. Um, I've uh, been in the events and entertainment industry um, for about 15 years um, now, started out working on local community festivals uh, just as a promoter. Um, and then um, uh, then somewhere down the line figured out uh, all of these people need a lawyer and then uh, became <laughs> became that lawyer that helps um, uh, helps people clear music for synchronization and uh, um, books uh, or goes through international uh, booking and contracting agreements for um, for west festivals, concerts, um, and smaller scale events that are happening um, in India. Um, along the way, set up a bunch of companies, 
in the creative industries um, and uh, I've been working with uh, specifically European businesses for the past, I would like to say now, five to six years uh, on helping them um, either enter the Indian market or set up shop uh, in the Indian market or work with different partners um, so that joint ventures can be formed and um, they can begin to operate their business uh, in India. So that's uh, uh, that's it in short. Um, I think Ma uh, Martin briefly mentioned that uh, we've now set up the India Music Exchange. Uh, so Sushil and I uh, took um, all our learnings over these past few years of dealing with uh, EMI and uh, all the various music export offices across the world. And we said, hey, um, let's not just buy, let's try and sell some stuff too. So uh, we also reciprocated with a um, with an Indian music um, exchange office. So it's, it's uh, where we're going to push out Indian artists and Indian music uh, into the world, but also at the same time, we will act as a mobility office for other export offices to gain more knowledge um, and insight into the Indian market. Uh, and to also help and work with uh, people like you um, and offer info or relevant info. And like Martin said, it's more of a continent than a country. So um, just to that, uh, to explain to you uh, how diverse it is, uh, we've got um, 28, uh, now 29 uh, states in India and a couple of union territories. So almost exactly the number of member countries that the EU has uh, uh, at this point. Um, and each of those states, um, I'd like to say is more, um, it is uh, probably the equivalent of um, a country's culture um, in the EU. And um, uh, But where we outdo ourselves is with the number of languages within those states also. So um, you could have... Um, and you would have a minimum of two or three languages um, in each of these states. Um, so our parliament officially operates in 22 languages. Um, and we uh, we have culture uh, that kind of changes culture, language, and food. Uh, culture, language, and cuisine changes almost every 100 kilometers um, in India. So this is, uh, this is something that... Um, and that I guess you guys are familiar with because you are in Europe uh, and if you've done business in uh, uh, with uh, people or countries in Europe um, you um, you should uh, try to employ that same kind of um, European economic area or free trade area um, kind of strategy with India but for everything else um, it's completely different so um, you can employ your cultural strategy in, in that part. Just one um, slide to uh, to share here, which will give you a quick uh, snapshot of uh, what the Indian market is like in terms of numbers. Um, this was published earlier this year in a report that Ernst & Young uh, put out. Um, and uh, this was to showcase uh, kind of how the Indian publishing market has really boomed uh, and is growing at a at a pace that is unmatched uh, internationally right now. So the biggest statistic I think for um, for your eyes is seven hundred and fifty million uh, <clears throat> phones, uh, which are uh, accumulation of smartphones and phones that are uh, that have the ability to um to play radio uh, or to conduct radio on the phone um the real number of phones is much higher because in india uh, you have a fair amount of the population that has two phones uh, instead of one but this number is only phones that are capable of either streaming music or um tuning into a radio station now with this huge number this kind of gives you um, this kind of gives you um, 
the let's say if you are talking about a funnel of people listening to music and consuming music so this is we are at the top of the funnel and then we'll kind of filter down or distill down um there are 10 million plus uh, live events um, and weddings weddings is a big uh, big part uh, of the market um, in india to give you um, to give you an estimate the music industry worldwide is about 3.5 um uh, 3.5 billion dollars india spends about 140 uh, billion dollars a year um on weddings so this is uh, this uh, this 10 million plus events number uh, constitutes a large part of weddings and social events and social gatherings of which music forms a part um, we have a thousand radio stations which is not a um, not such a big number um, but uh, we've uh, from the time that uh, we got our independence till today we've seen um, we've seen the number of licenses that the government has uh, been giving out to radio stations and the uh, at the auctions um, we've seen that there aren't too many people who are uh, too many radio stations that are, that can pay the high price of running a radio station um, and the the majority of these thousands survive on advertising money so you have very few community radio stations or very few independent radio stations that can uh, run or survive um, on anything other than advertising. Uh, from these thousand, the percentage um, that actually play English music would be less than 10%. Um, uh, international music uh, would be between eight to 12% uh, uh, in that range. Uh, we have about 100 and and, uh, 1450 tv shows related to music um some of um some of the major music channels that came in um like uh, mtv while they started off with english music and international music went into more uh, national and regional programming um and then we had brands like vh1 and then more uh, v uh, vh1 uh, sorry before that channel v um then uh, VH1 and other uh, other entities like 9XO um, that came in and broadcast uh, English and international uh, music videos and music on, on their channels. Uh, this number also includes a lot of reality TV uh, shows that are music based, a lot of contests, um, the regional. Um, regional TV programming or what we call the GEC, which is general entertainment. Um, one of the most popular formats is um, is uh, music contests um, that have kids, uh, to, uh, kids to young adults uh, and semi-professional or uh, amateur singers competing in contests um, on their uh, TV stations. So, that's the number on TV. Uh, another uh, big number that could be your focus is um, we have 15,000 plus music uh, concerts and almost um, 100 uh, or more, more than 100 of these are large format um, music concerts. That means that they have more than 5,000 uh, attendees um, in the audience and from uh, from this, um, then um, I would say there is at least uh, twenty to thirty percent in the large format that uh, that books or programs international artists um, from across the world. Of course, uh, being a Commonwealth country, we've uh, you know the, the Anglo American acts uh, dominate uh, uh, in India both on the uh, on the charts as well as on the programming um, of festivals. Um, one uh, coming now more on to the audio streaming side of uh, things, we have um, we have nine major uh, DSPs, um, and this includes the audio uh, and the video side. 
on the audio side you've got uh, dsps and uh, for those of you uh, th these are streaming platforms essentially so audio streaming platforms um going from the biggest to the smallest uh, today it's uh, wink um wink geo savan uh, gana hangama um and then on the on the video side uh, we have hotstar uh, sony live z5 um mx player and uh, i am uh, z5 mx player and alt balaji so these um, these are the the nine on the audio and video side um that you can make a note of and uh, right now just to give you a sense of the audio uh, streaming platforms also um number 1 is spotify uh, in india in terms of uh, consumption and payouts uh, quickly followed by wink uh, so the number 2 is an indian dsp but number 1 is the international dsp spotify that you i'm sure you all know um very important statistic is uh, is this one right here um, indians spend uh, 2 hours more than the global average of music consumed per week um so and this number is really growing we we're, we're going to see this number go up to 25 27 uh, hours of music listening per week in this year um and the reason that's uh, that a lot of this is happening uh, a lot of this has happened and will continue to happen is about 6 to 7 years ago we saw uh, we saw Uh, a big telecom player offer 4G internet free to um, to Indians um, as long as they subscribe to uh, their SIM card, um, they could have free 4G internet for two years. And this really brought a lot of people onto um, onto the internet, brought them onto streaming platforms. Uh, in turn, uh, to keep the streaming platform numbers going. most streaming uh, platforms and most consumers in india are non paid audio streaming consumers so it's a freemium model that means it's kind of india as an ad supported market um for the uh, for the most part and uh, that's a very important um, that's a very important point for you to keep in mind because the amount that people spend uh, on music on uh, on audio subscriptions is much much lower than the international average although we consume a lot more uh, i mean fairly more music uh, at this point um youtube if we consider video uh, dsps or if we consider audio and video dsps together youtube is the number one um, streaming platform in india and uh, therefore when we say audio streaming platforms we don't figure in youtube but if we were to say audio and video youtube would be the number one um, by a mile uh, so much so that the largest uh, youtube channel in the world is owned by a label in india called t series they have the most amount of subscribers in the world and they currently have a cumulative 212 billion uh, total views um so i think uh, the others you can see there's about 200000 food service establishments in india that play music uh, we've got um, in our metro cities um, and that is cities with a population of about 10 million inhabitants um, we have about 271 malls um, and so i i think this fairly um, fairly gives you a statistically a picture um, of india of just the the digital landscape um, and the on ground landscape in india so i will stop sharing uh, my screen there and um, sushil i think based on just everyone's introductions uh, maybe we can um maybe we can talk about the live music um live music field first and then we can talk about um we can talk about the uh, streaming platforms and the other opportunities that there are for music in india
I think also to add, uh, just because for us, it was really mind blowing uh, when the numbers were mentioned, when a year ago we were in, uh, in Mumbai, in Bombay, uh, that's also, so there's always a lot of stories and lots of uh, topics to discuss uh, when it gets to India. The most important aspect, I think that you have to keep in mind that uh, as you have uh, shared numbers, uh, these numbers are exponentially growing at these moments. Uh, so uh, one of the reasons uh, other than the really heartwarming personal contacts that of course it always helps, um the simple fact that i think this is the moment uh for anyone who's not really acting to find good partners locally will be off the train i i have this feeling maybe you can like uh, contradict me on that uh but i think this is pretty much the right time to to start building bridges uh for us so what i wanted to just add that everything that has been said uh it's on an exponential uh curve up at these moments. Uh, yeah. Also, I just heard just now, actually an hour ago, uh, that was a financial report house actually, and I don't want to go into politics, but it was a political uh, comparison, how China acted like uh, 10, 15 years ago, and now which are the uh, basic approach from Indian uh, uh, governmental point of view to really boost businesses and really have a lot of ties to, uh, to Europe and to the Western part of the, the globe as well. Uh, the same, uh, I'm sure it's all the, all the other, but as like these connections are severed with China, India is pretty much taking over the lead uh, on that. So that's really good to keep in mind uh, in development. And sorry for bullshitting too much. Uh, just addition, practical knowledge, I think you will be interested because the numbers are huge and really about like the, the smaller suggestions, uh, where to go, which are the best connecting points and so on. Oh, Anish, you can tell yeah. it in words if you want, Anish. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Martha, I've been talking about numbers. This is a number that just came out yesterday. It was by the event management association or event uh, event event and entertainment management association which said footfalls at india's music festival surged by 82% in 2023 uh now just to kind of uh, reaching 13.5 million attendees now this is obviously an all india music festival kind of number uh but also to kind of just kind of flashback four years, which is 2020, uh, where the world changed, obviously. Um, the growth in India really got accelerated uh, post-pandemic. Uh, you know, obviously, 2020 was, was was the year which was down. 21 was still struggling and people were still... But what happened in, I would say, the second half of 21 and 22 and 23 was was uh, it's almost overwhelming from like from my point of view or raf's point of view who've been here and we're right here the number of festivals the number of people attending festivals the number of artists looking at india the number of uh, the artists getting born in india itself so like everything just shot up there were artists who created their audiences online during the pandemic um who nobody knew them. They were, they were, they were like, nobody knew of them. They probably had, they, they had not had a single release. Uh, they probably had a few hundred friends following them on Instagram. And, and they are the ones who kind of, you know, there's one artist called um, um, Anup Jain, who created uh, an online fan following so strong during the pandemic that in 2022, when he came out for uh, for the for his first live show, he had 5,000 people turn up for his first ever live show. So, yes, uh, where where the live music is con well, where the live side of the business is concerned, of course, the, it's fast growing. The number of venues are increasing. Uh, there's more cultural kind of angles of support to the business. Um, so the number of venues, the number of festivals, the number of boutique festivals or micro festivals that 
I would say uh, uh, a lot of it is not even getting counted, to be honest. Uh, I, today, I see almost uh, almost every, you know, there was, there was a time till two, three years ago when the music business and the festivals were focused more um, in the metros, so more of the bigger cities. Uh, but, you know, India is a big country and people like to travel. Destination festivals, uh, festivals in palaces, festivals on the beach, festivals in the hills, festivals in forests. Uh, the number of the numbers of those have really shot up over the last three years. Um, I would say has shot up almost to the to the tune of five to six hundred percent. Now, when I say five to six hundred percent, it's five to six times because before, at some point, it wasn't as 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 much. Uh, there were the bigger festivals which were hosting uh, international artists, uh, local artists, as well as. You know, these bigger festivals were focused. So there were like almost three to four focused areas where the bigger festivals were happening. And that's where all, all the energies were focused on. I would say that is changing rapidly. Uh, almost, I would say almost, I would say at least 70% of the Indian states uh, are fast growing on destination festivals, micro festivals, uh, festival and by micro festivals, I mean festivals that are hosting attendees to the tune of three to four thousand people. Yeah, um, those are the smaller festivals. The larger festivals obviously go up to the tune of fifty thousand people, sixty thousand people. Um, India also saw, sorry, that's my cat. Uh, India also saw with Ed Sheeran's concert just two weeks ago. Uh, India also saw the the largest audience for a solo show for any international or Indian artist, which is 53,000 people right in the middle of Mumbai. Um, so, yeah, but now when you're looking at it as an entry point, um, you know, I've been, I've been talking to a lot of managers and agents over the last eight to 10 months. Um, and it's very, it's not, it's not a, it's not that one size fits all. It's not that, one entry point is the right entry point for all. Um, you know, there are two ways to look at it. One is you start with touring being an entry point, uh, and then you kind of go and assess what circuit of touring suits you as an artist or suits your artist best. Um, whether it's uh, whether it's touring on the venue circuit, whether it's touring on the festival circuit, it could be different for everybody, right? Uh, but then recorded music and the recorded side of the business is another entry point. So when I have been talking to artists, I have been sitting with them and kind of assessing for them, with them, in terms of what suits them best and what suits their music in India best. Should they be touring and building an audience first? Or should they be, should they be releasing music which is targeted, whether it's a collaboration with an Indian artist and should they be releasing music and marketing their music and building an audience online first and then get to a live audience? So <clears throat> at least in, in, my, in my understanding and learning so far, it's more of the pop artists, which, which can work more in a collaborative, recorded marketing direction and then build an audience and then get to live. Uh, whereas more alternative music, more electronic music, more live electronic rock music, um, these genres are genres which can look more at a live circuit first, uh, get here, build their audiences. Uh, over the years, there have been some really amazing case studies, like we, we mentioned to you last year as well. FKJ being one of the case studies who's been coming to India since eight years now. Um, I think FKJ's first concert was in Mumbai with 50 people. Um, nobody kind of knew him at that time and and suddenly his last concert, so this concert with 50 people eight years ago uh, was in a small venue called Bonobo, which was like eight years ago. But his last concert attracted, I think he sold around 6,000 tickets for a solo opening, open air kind of concert. Um, Dub FX is another artist who has kind of consistently been coming to India. In fact, 
Dub FX is an artist who again saw, I think, just about 70 to 80 people in his first year, in his first visit to India. And then it was, you know, a collaboration with an, with an Indian classical artist called Mahesh Vinayakaram. Um, nobody saw that coming. It just happened. It it was an organic process. It wasn't something that that they constructed saying, hey, oh, I'm going to come to India and I'm going to I'm going to see what happens and let's work on a track together and shoot a music video. No, it wasn't worked like that. Um, it was simply he was here. He was in India. He, he was meeting some people. He was meeting the right kind of people. Um, and he didn't even meet the artist. He actually met a videographer. Um, he met a videographer who had the idea saying, hey, I feel you. And Mahesh Vinaykaram, who's an Indian classical singer, uh, I feel you guys would really vibe well together. So he's like, all right, let's just go to the rooftop and see what we can. So they literally just went up to a rooftop in Mumbai city um, and they jammed, they created something. Next day, they recorded it. Uh, they went back to the same rooftop, shot a music video. And if you see that music video today it has a few million views. Now that is something that, that was a bridge. There was an artist collaboration that happened just very organically uh but yeah there's no there's it's not that organic is the only way to do it there's also a way to construct it and strategically design it in a way created with a target to create an audience in india so yeah no definitely no one size fits all um but yeah there is it's a mix of an anr process as well as the life process um and then again, it kind of depends. Now I'm look. I'm just talking about it from the artist's point of view. I'm not even yet getting into the publisher's point of view or a sync and licensing point of view because there are different objectives, there are different methods and different processes to to approach those. But there's enough for all. Uh, my point, uh, concluding concluding this point would be that there's enough for all. Uh, there are enough festivals in the country. There are enough um opportunities from recorded music point of view as well as from a live music point of view um would that make sense to mention few of the key the uh, live music uh i would rather say cities than uh like where you should focus if you want to enter that's one question and the other maybe just to a side of that uh, and i know that you're involved in this social as well of uh, which are the uh, the most obvious agencies that or either sh should you rather contact an agency or you know which would be the first steps if you are like aiming out via agency because I suppose like going directly to venues that would be much more difficult uh, oh. uh, so what would be your what would be your suggestion uh, uh, I would say my suggestion would be to reach out to festivals to start with uh, rather than even agencies. You know, it's uh, like anywhere else, as I've noticed, even in Europe, uh, a lot of people, whether it's the programmers or the bookers or festival runners, um, are wearing a lot of hats. They're wearing a lot of different hats. They're wearing hats as agents, managers. Sometimes some of them are artists themselves. So so it's 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 a mix. It's not it's not, uh, but yeah, approaching festivals, I would say would be, <clears throat> would be uh, the most optimum as I've seen it is because, you know, once you're on a festival lineup, there is some sort of marketing that you achieve out of the, out of being on that lineup. Um, there is some sort of bridge as your first entry point in the live circuit that it creates. Uh, and it becomes easier for venues or even you know, usually if you're coming in for a festival in India, um, you won't be, you'd be contractually restricted to play any other festival, but you won't be contractually restricted to play any other venue. Um, so it's always first, it's a good idea to reach out to a festival. Um, and once festival booking is done, it's always a good idea to ask them to point you in the right direction. Uh, it would be in some cases, the festival booker itself would be a person who can get you more gigs. In some cases, festivals do pre-promo gigs. Uh, a lot of the festivals do that. They do kind of promo gigs leading up in other cities than their city with the artists that are on the lineup 
leading up, uh, say, a, a week before or 10 days before. Some festivals do it even three to four weeks before. Um, so, you know, like road. So if there's super, it's a festival called Supersonic, um, they would do, which is one of the bigger festivals that happens in India, VH1. Uh, it's called VH1 Supersonic. It's a, it's a, it's a festival run by the Wyacom group. Um, they do a road to Supersonic for almost a month before. Uh, Lollapalooza at the same time does a road to Lollapalooza for almost three weeks before. So, so it's always good to be in touch with that festival team to be able to guide you. Sometimes they might not be able to guide you. Sometimes they'll be like, hey, no, I, I'm just too busy. You just need to look for somebody else or I'm just going to connect you to somebody else and see where you can take that conversation to. Uh, but yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a more fluid way to be at a festival first and then get the festival booker or the festival itself to book more than just the festival slot for you. Maybe some promo slots before, maybe some promo slots even after. So that's not impossible. But yeah, coming to the cities that you're, I would say, um, whereas there would be, if I have to just broadly go as per the zone, so the north has, has Delhi, New Delhi, of course, being the capital of the, um, of the country, um, that being one of the cities, Mumbai, Goa, uh, but Bangalore. But now again, you have to realize that these are the these are the cities that are hosting the festivals. Uh, some in some cases the festivals are even outside of these cities. But the promoters, the bookers, are not necessarily in that city. Um, but I would say the three hotspots would be Mumbai, Bangalore, and Delhi. Uh, Goa is a hotspot because of the number of festivals and the number of gigs Goa hosts is way higher. But again, uh, all those promoters are based in Mumbai or Delhi or Bangalore. So, so Goa is a place to be at. It's a great destination to be at a festival at because it has a lot more venues and it can, you. I mean, you can always, there are artists who, who I have known who have come to Goa for, for one festival. Uh, they've played some other cities, then they've just taken a break in Goa for five days and just played three more gigs. Just while they were sitting in Goa, they got approached by people. So there is a method to do this through an agent as well. Uh, but once you're on a festival lineup, it always helps getting more. So I would say that is a good first step. Uh, but it might, again, it might not be the best step for each and every genre, right? Uh, for, so for more of more alternative, more electronic, uh, more live electronica or rock, uh, I would say this would be uh, a more optimum method to go by. Guys, anyone, a question to drop in, to go on? There yeah, maybe some... is there any like overview of the live scene? Could be like a list of festivals or maybe even artists, uh, music news, something like uh, like that. Like main genres, you mean like? A... No, it could be like any genres probably, but if it yeah. could be focused more on the life life industry, but even like a general overview of the Indian music industry would be cool. If you can suggest something. Um, so there is, um, I mean, if you're talking about festivals and if you're talking about, uh, so I would say apart from Lollapalooza, obviously, which is one of the bigger names, which is in India right now, VH1 Supersonic is one that I just mentioned, um, a more electronic focused, <clears throat> a more electronic focused festival. And these are one of the better festivals. I mean, these are one of the more bigger, more established and a lot more credible festivals. Uh, there's a festival called Magnetic Fields that happens in the in the state of Rajasthan. It happens in a palace. It's a great festival. It's one of my favorites for that matter. Um, in the south, in Bangalore, there's a festival called Echoes of Earth, uh, which is in the seventh year now. They just had their sixth edition. And with the sixth edition, they also announced an, another edition in Goa. So they're doing two festivals in the year now. 
Um, so that's echoes of Earth for that matter. Um, if you look east, uh, I would say one of the most, one of the biggest festivals is a festival called Hornbill. Um, now the east, uh, east of India, which is which we call the northeast of India, uh, which consists of a cluster of seven states, it's another, it's uh, it's another ball game altogether. Not only booking gigs, but even going all the way there, traveling all the way there. Um, so you know, sometimes you like like anywhere. So say in Europe, when I am looking for gigs for my artist in Europe, uh, I would look for somebody, an agent to get me gigs in Europe and then an agent to get me gigs for East Europe separately, right? Mm -hmm. That's the same way that it works here. So the Northeast would be a completely different um, method, a completely different agent. Uh, and in fact, even if you even if you tell an agent in Mumbai um, or New Delhi or Bangalore saying, hey, I'm going to just work with you on Northeast, uh, an agent highly likely an agent is just going to bow out and say, no, I, I cannot deal with the Northeast because I don't know how the Northeast functions. Um, it's a very interesting state. I mean, it's a very interesting side of India and a very interesting cluster of seven states. Uh, it's also one of the uh, two states, the Meghalaya and Nagaland, are uh, two of the rare states in India that support music, uh, that fund music, they fund culture. Uh, they have their budgets uh, for large scale as well as small scale concerts. However, there are a few more political challenges that that side of the of the business kind of uh, that side of the industry kind of deals with. Uh, but that's okay. That's not for you to worry about too much. Uh, it's for the agent that you could kind of work with to worry about that part of of things. But mm -hmm. I would say there's a festival called Zero Festival that also happens there in the Northeast. Again, um, it would take you a three-hour flight from Mumbai and then a 15-hour drive just to get to that festival. Uh, a 15-hour drive through mountains and hills. But then again, it's, uh, it's, it's an audience which is highly engaged. Um, the Northeast, I would say, is also an audience which is very high on on English music or, or, or more creatively open to new genres of music. So it's a very interesting audience. And they are they 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 really show up. They really turn up for gigs and festivals. And you know, it's like it's the same logic. And if in Mumbai there are Mumbai or Delhi or Bangalore, there are on an average, there are 10 gigs every night on an average. Uh, in one of these northeastern cities, there would be, say, five gigs in a week. Mm -hmm. So, so when there is anything that happens, everybody really shows up. So they're way more engaged. Um, and Raf, maybe you can even tell them about the report, which was about the trigger cities, which was about uh, the algorithm, which was about triggering an algorithm, not not about making a music for the algorithm. But once you've done with your music, um, uh, Raf, uh, can yeah. you just quickly add to that? Yeah, so in, uh, I think, 2022, uh, if I'm uh, right, uh, Chartmetric, uh, this company that provides um, kind of chart data and uh, analytics to artists, labels, and uh, content creators around the world, put out this report of trigger cities, and they identified 20 trigger cities um, of which seven uh, cities are in India. So what these trigger cities actually are uh, is um, cities where if you uh, if you manage to get a certain amount of listeners um, really quick into your first, let's say, uh, 10,000 streams or 100,000 streams, uh, you will be more than likely, more than very, very likely to make it to uh, a million or more. So there are, uh, uh, Sushil and I always mention this, this uh, I think we've answered the question of uh, where you can play in India, um, but this is the answer of how to play India. Uh, so if, if you don't want to uh, actually come here uh, and tour or play a festival, 
you really want to be able to uh, to get your music trending around the world you don't even need to come to india just get your music playing or target those trigger cities uh, in india and then you can use uh, those numbers to push your global numbers and to push um, people sitting in your backyard to listen to your music so it's um, um, yeah it's kind of you uh, you go halfway around the world um, to get really popular uh, in the Czech Republic itself, uh, it's a long route, but it's it's much faster. <laughs> and uh, just just to add on the list of uh, festivals, um, I think a lot of you at at some point will um, will receive uh, offers or receive emails or may see um, may see information about college festivals um, in India um and uh, so just just so you know the the bigger college festivals are organized by the indian institute of technology or the indian institute of management and those are the ones that are a bit more professionally organized even though they're college festivals um uh, don't expect too much but they're a bit more professional than um than the rest of them um but the rest of them are of no standard <laughs> Uh, rest of the college festivals have no standard, so don't expect too much from these uh, these college festivals. Can I have a quick question about that? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So I just have a question. Let's say if you'd like to perform or reach out to those festivals, what would be a good timing? Like, let's say now we are in the spring. And let's say we are talking about festivals in the fall. So like, how is there like, you know, like the round circle of reaching out and getting back to and boom. So also to give you a quick, just uh, a quick flip, uh, Lenka, you obviously kind of maybe know about this, uh, about India, that the festival season in India uh, is, is a flip, which is actually an advantage for any European artist looking to tour India because uh, the festival season in India is from October until March. In fact, right now, we're almost towards the end of festival season. There are not going to be too many festivals for the next six months. Uh, that's mainly because India experiences uh, the monsoon, which is the rains that happen, and then the, the summer before that. So this is really what we call off-season, and then the season really kicks in uh, I would say October, November onwards and peaks in Jan and Feb. Um, now is the right time to reach out to the festivals. Um, the, now is when they are in the process of programming, bookings. That's what's happening from now. Obviously, it happens all the way until until September. Uh, but yeah, now is now is a great time to start reaching out to them. For the festivals who are who are programming for November and December um, are the ones which uh, which are programming right now. Mm -hmm. Great. And do you think those festivals they also have their contacts on their websites, or it's hard to get those contacts, and you really just need to know the people? Uh, who knows the people? Most of their contacts, most of their contacts would be on their website, um, and then again, the, you know the. It's just that the the bookers at these festivals they keep changing, mm -hmm. so it's almost every year that you reach out to a new booker. Sometimes, sometimes it's the same booker. I don't depends depends on the festival. Another really interesting festival uh, that I'd like to point out, apart from Raf has mentioned Goa International Jazz Festival, another really inter interesting festival is called uh, the Rajasthan International Folk Festival. Uh, it happens in a palace again, uh, which sees artists and collaborations with Indian folk artists and international artists from all around the world. Uh, yeah, I just uh, just kind of remembered meant to mention that festival as well, uh, which is a great festival. Can we please have the name again in the in the comments so we can just I'll you know? Yeah. Thank you so much. Perfect. That, that's Jodhpur Riff, right? Yeah. Yeah, I've I've put it down, uh, link already. Oh, okay. thank you, thank you, Rafa. Okay, uh, hi. Can I have a quick questions or a few questions? Very important, and I I hope for also other 
uh, other uh, members uh, the, the, on, on the our conference. So first of all is for the independent music scene. I'm not talking about the mainstream uh, pop music or uh, Bollywood, you know, a la Bollywood uh, sound, etc., etc. I talking about very sophisticated, independent uh, music, unique niche music. So, do you think uh, there is some uh, agency, booking agency, who can actually a little bit reopen the doors for this uh, independent festivals? What you mentioned in the chat. Uh, do you think it's a way that uh, some of our Czech, for example, Czech artists? Uh, can be uh, represented by some uh, exclusive list by some Indian uh, music booking agency to to penetrate to 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 the uh, festival promoters. Do you think it's a way? How it can work as well? I mean, there is a way for sure, but I'm 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 very uh, I'm unable to answer your question because I haven't heard your music yet. So it's only after I listen to what music you're talking about. Uh, is when I'll be able to kind of point you in the right direction. Uh, okay. Send me a few links. I'm just going to drop my um, email address on the chat as well. Yes. Uh, feel free to send me a few links and I may be able to point you in the right direction. Uh -huh. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you very much, Sushil. And I have also uh, one question. How, how do listeners in India perceive music that it's not pop music on this mainstream, but also not traditional Indian music either. Uh, for example, from from Europe, uh, because also you know the different scale, Indian uh, scale system pattern. So, how how do listeners in India perceive music generally? Um, it, it, yeah, maybe I'll take that. So. Uh, thank you firstly, thank you Rafa. yeah yeah firstly uh, listeners the the mass listeners in india don't listen to music they watch music uh, so it's uh, we are a very um, cinema or visual oriented uh, uh, audience mm -hmm. so you will see a, you'll see a lot of um, distribute music distributors in india will also tell you, you know if you want to distribute uh, your music, it has to be accompanied by a music video. And uh, for a large part, I mean, remember when I, I said YouTube is the biggest streaming platform um, in India, uh, you'll have a lot of people who just play YouTube um, music videos in the background and they'll be doing their work, but they use YouTube. Um, and when a new song releases, they will watch the video uh, look for a hook step because that's you know that's the film background that we uh, that we come from and that's kind of pe penetrating into the non-film music uh, or let's say the not so pop um, and the the genres that are I mean the genres or the languages that are non-mainstream they're always um, we're always looking for a way to engage and interact with it. But to answer your question with a with a square number, um, it would so the consu consumers in India that listen to international music are are at about um, sixty million uh, people today listen to international music uh, in India. Now, sixteen only sixteen one six six zero. Your sixth is here. Ah, sixteen million. 60 million people listen to international music uh, in India. Now that is uh, a majority of that is going to be um, is going to be Anglo American uh, music. So when you actually come down to uh, what is uh, you know, what is uh, the number of listeners that can actually tune in to your music or that can actually follow you uh, as an artist. Um, it really depends on the genre uh, and then depends on uh, depends on the language um, and a few other considerations. But it is 
still a fairly large number of um, listeners that you can uh, that you can garner from this market. If you and remember, if you target it correctly with one of those seven trigger cities, even a hundred thousand listeners could be enough to uh, to get you moving around the world. Yeah. Okay. I think there was also uh, some questions from Anish. Um, um, about artist label relations. Um, yeah. Um, so, as, as much as uh, you'd like to call, um, I mean, you'd like uh, you'd like to call it independent. Uh, right now, indie is a buzzword in the Indian music industry. It, it's more. Uh, independent is more of a genre right now than um, than a way to describe um, uh, who you're affiliated with or which label or publisher you're affiliated with um, the uh, we for the large part we continue to be a buyout market so that means a label will come uh, give an artist in india a flat fee um, and that fee um, gets them uh, an assignment of the copyright in the sound recording and the publishing. So the la most labels in India, also the publishers, uh, continue to be the publishers because of this. In the past, most labels that uh, invested in film music uh, would get the master in publishing from the producer who'd get it from um, who'd get it from each of the contributors um, and then sell it to the music label Lock, Stock and Barrel. Um, yeah, so unfortunately, Anish, the um, the type of deals have not changed um, that much. So the majority remains buyout. But um, let's say in the remaining five percent, there are um, there are a lot of artists who are being offered deals by distributors. These are kind of advance against royalty deals, um, and that kind of allows them to retain their um, copyright, to retain their intellectual property. Um, and there are a few artists that uh, that are working with um, that are working with the larger um, labels on uh, on a limited license. So they assign the copyright for 10 years and then comes or they license the masters and the publishing for 10 years and then it comes back to them or 20 years and then it comes back to them. Um, yeah, even labels like Sony and Warner, uh, to a limited extent have been working, um, yeah, working on this in the past two okay. years. Okay. Years. Uh, can I have a one quick, uh, Raphael? It's, does any, it's, does exist any like guidebook, festival guidebook, where is the contacts, you know, um, uh, information? Because in Europe, you know, even in Czech Republic, we have like a guidebook where is the cities and there is the name of the festival, who is responsible, email, telephone, website, etc. It's even can be PDF uh, catalog, not printed, of course. Um, what do you think? Yeah, there's there's no real guide. I mean, there, there's no real guidebook like that. Uh, there is. Um... I need to create one, definitely. It's like, um, I mean, compared to Czech Republic, it's just, um, yeah, 140 times bigger than Czech Republic. So it's, uh, I'm sure it's going to be fast. Um, but there, there is um, something called festivals from India, where you can see a lot of the festivals. Um, that's, that's a website that uh, tries to capture most of them. Um, there is another conference that Sushil is actually going to be speaking on called uh, Shores of uh, India. Um, that kind of, that conference has, um, um, that conference is at the end of April and uh, it has the promoters um, or someone on the behalf of all types of festivals and conferences in India uh, present at that uh, one. So you'll, that's a, just looking at the website of that uh, event will tell you um yeah will tell you who's uh who's doing what in india and linka maybe to answer your question if their contacts are not on their website uh, at least you have their names on this website and then 
you can slide into their DMs on LinkedIn. I think also just to add, which I th it's important, just to repeat that uh, Sushil and Rafael, just in the midst of forming the Indian Music Export Initiative, so uh, and those offices usually are reference points in the future. I'm not telling to jump on them uh, with everything, but I think that's eventually we'll get there because it's much more about filtering proper contacts uh, than having a database. I mean, the the Czech database took really long time for us to make it and to maintain it is really horrible, uh, but we do it. We try to do it at least, uh, but it's really a brutal difference in numbers uh, if you want to narrow it down that much. Uh, so, yeah. Um, so that... Just a quick gist on the website festivals from India. Uh, that website covers all festivals, uh, not only music festivals. So just in case you want to filter, just a quick process is to just go through that website, see what interests you, and then try to get to the respective, or just Google the name of that festival and check it out if that's what it's, if that's what you're looking for. And I have one question on the workflow um, of the copyright. Uh, is it the same as in Europe that uh, we have like collecting societies who are collecting the money from broadcasting for, for publishing, for performance? Or is it different in India? Um, so it is... Um... It is getting a lot more similar now. Um, for uh, up till 2012, it was quite different. But since then, uh, we are getting more. We are get, We've gotten much closer to the European uh, model. Um, and uh, I'll. Uh, what I would say is yes, we have. Uh, we have a CMOs. Um, so we have the author rights. Uh, CMO IPRS, the Indian Performing Rights Society. Um, although it is uh, in the title, it is performing rights. Um, it also covers the mechanical rights. So, in and this society treats um, performing um, performing rights and mechanical rights equally. So, any uh, rupee that it receives, it treats uh, it as fifty percent performing, fifty percent mechanical. Um, we have two uh, we have one recognized neighboring rights uh, society called rmpl and when i say recognized it's recognized by the by the government um, and we have two uh, neighboring rights rmes one is called ppl like phonographic performance limited um, and that is um, that's like the uk ppl it's affiliated with ifpi and uh, P PPL UK as well, and uh, there is Novex. Uh, Novex Communications is the other neighboring rights uh, uh, RME. Um, on the we also have in India the neighboring right is split between the label side and the performer side. So we have something called the performers right, and um, we have the Indian Singers and Musicians Rights Association, uh, which is the um, the CMO for the performers, uh, the performers' rights. Um, yeah, I, I think that's uh, that's uh, pretty much it. Um, most of the these CMOs have international uh, affiliations uh, in most of the global networks. But the biggest problems right uh, biggest problem right now is um, is the level of compliance uh, in India that uh, uh, while I mentioned that, you know, public doesn't want to pay for subscriptions on audio streaming platforms, uh, restaurant owners and bars and clubs um, and event organizers uh, don't necessarily want to pay the CMOs uh, license fees um, for using their music. So we are at, at about a 1.12% compliance rate um uh, uh, <laughs> in india at this point but to go back to what martin said it's growing at an exponential rate so just to give you an idea um 
this 1.12% um, is about um, is about 250, um, uh, 200 and sorry, uh, 270 million uh, dollars um, at this point. Um, IPRS, which is the authorized uh, CMO, um, five years ago they were their collection was five million dollars. Uh, um, today it is seventy million dollars. Um, by the end of next year, they'll be at about one hundred and twenty million dollars. So uh, they are they are growing. They are the fastest growing CMO in the world. Um, and right now it's um, yeah, it's just. Uh, if we take one percent every year for the next <laughs> uh, for the next five years, we we continue to be the fastest growing just because um, we have ninety nine percent more to grow um, and the others don't. So nice, Thank lots you. of room for growth. <laughs> And I have one more question regarding more uh, the music synchronization. Maybe Christina will be interested too. Um, I'm curious how much the music supervisors in India work with, let's say, local artists. Like, how much is the is this business like uh, you know local focused on like promoting the local artists, and like how much they work, let's say, with the European and American artists, and also. Um, what would be the best way to get in touch with, let's say, sync agencies or music supervisors? Do you have any sync festivals or, you know, like kind of like networking opportunities? Like there is a music expo in LA, so maybe something like that in India. What would you recommend? Uh, with uh, with sync, it really depends. Uh, let's say for film and TV uh, versus advertising. Uh, it depends on the target market, right? So the the film and TV, the most amount of content that is consumed um, is uh, is content in a in Indian languages. Um, so those are Indian based plot lines, and a lot of the times those Indian based plot lines, unless unless they make room for uh, some kind of international influences, will only incorporate Indian um, Indian music. Um, Unless we're talking about background score, um, that side of things, the market on the music supervision side has uh, just begun to kind of organize itself over the past three years, um, I would say, where music supervisors have begun to be trained and have begun to um, work in an, in an orderly manner where... Um, I would say the first time a music supervisor created a cue sheet would have been in 2020. So, yeah. uh, <laughs> so um, that uh, this this is um, we are at the birth of this uh, industry uh, or this sector in India, and with that, it'll take some time for sync agents to kind of prop up and um, and then also be able to represent you there are a few platforms that will happily license your music and um, um, and put it up on their platforms but you won't get a single sync from these platforms just because none of the music supervisors work with them or um, you know that market doesn't really um, doesn't really exist uh, as a whole but uh, that being said um, there have been some major syncs uh, for um, um, that have used international music, um, a lot of European music as well. There's been, uh, I think, a French uh, French artist, uh, Levi's used uh, her song Makeba, uh, but I'm uh, I'm quite sure that was more an international mandate that came into a team in India rather than a selection. Um, By an in, yeah. And uh, also, you know, a lot of uh, why what Raf just mentioned, which is like the segment of music supervision, is just about kind of gathering some kind of steam and some momentum. Is also it's 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 facing a big challenge right now, is because it's never been there as a service or as a segment, right? But the function has still been has still been performed by somebody in the system, uh, whether it's in film or in advertising separately in film. It's been performed by the director or the associate director. Um, 
of the creative part of supervision, not the licensing part of it. But the creative part of it has either been performed by the director or been performed by uh, somebody in the director's team, right? And in advertising, it's the creative team or the director. Now, the thing is that they've been doing it for so long, for the last 30, 40 years or so, that now the, the whole concept of music supervision seems... Uh, to them, it seems like, hey, why do I even need this? I've been doing this for 20 years myself. Why do I need a separate person and pay a separate person to do that right now? I have been doing this for 20 years. I've done it successfully for 20 years. Um, and I'll continue doing it successfully for the next 20 years. Um, now, where the, where the licensing part of, of the supervision segment is concerned, that is somewhere where... Uh, where they still kind of re require uh, a third party service or somebody to negotiate it, somebody who understands, because at least the advertising side of the business does not understand music rights. So, you know, they have some really innocent questions uh, that come from them saying, hey man, I wanted this 40 year old song. I don't know why are they asking for a million on I'm like which 40 year old song? Oh, it's a it's a Pink Floyd song, man. I was like, okay, that's why. Like their their question was, hey, it's such an old song. Why would they require so much money for it? But uh, yeah, well, you know, that kind of goes to show of how uninformed um uh, they are about music licensing. Uh, but that is the, the licensing part of the supervision segment is, I would say, more crucial, or at least the advertising and the film side of a business see there's a need for somebody else to step in and do this because I can't do it, because I don't understand it. But at least a creative part of supervision, which is essentially identifying what really fits the need, it's just being, it's it has been performed by too many people in the creative ecosystem, and they continue to do so. Hello, may I have a, one quick question? Mark here. Um, how about uh, the radio uh, industry and maybe like student radios, uh, independent radios? So how does it look like in, in India? Uh, you said internet radios and? Uh, like uh, student radios, independent radios, like the, the, do people listen more to the internet radios or does the like the regular broadcasting um, work as a like music source for people? So we haven't seen, um, we haven't seen too much of internet radio um, in, uh, in India and it, it's, it's, um, we you would think that internet radio could go much wider uh, than traditional radio, but um, whatever internet radio we've seen has been the same traditional broadcasters just making um, their feeds available via the internet. Uh, that should soon change, and now uh, the um, the audio DSPs are going to venture more into internet radio. Um, but it, it's it's just been uh, from a from a legal point of view, it's it's been a bit complex to run internet radio stations um, in India. It's it's been um, and and the reason that's uh, that stuff is um, when it comes to the internet, there you can't license that music through uh, the CMOs. Uh, technically, you need to license it via the owners um, of um, the copyright. So there is no kind of uh, statutory license or voluntary license. Uh, I mean, no statutory or mechanical license. In this case, everything's a voluntary license when it comes to the internet. So um, yeah, like you would have the statutory rate for radio stations, um, those wouldn't apply to internet radio stations. And that's kind of been a huge hurdle uh, for internet radio to develop. That's why that, that kind of would answer your question of why uh, the radio stations have uh, done the, I mean, they just broadcast 
they are um, radio programming uh, on the internet uh, and now the audio dsps kind of want to do the same so the first one that we'll really see on a uh, do it on a professional or a large scale basis will be the audio streaming app gana um, in india gana will um, will do this with its network of radio stations radio mirchi and and all of those thank you very much uh, um any more questions guys uh because if not i would come uh with some further information first of all thank you rafael and sushil because it's always mind blowing to uh to get in topics uh and to really like uh, zoom in what is actually happening i really want to uh put the emphasis on the simple fact that whatever we hear now is on really on a on a on an exponential uh or even i could say okay it's not the best sounding explosive <laughs> uh growth actually how it actually really what we what we noticed and what we see uh, keep in mind the simple things that there is a conference next February. I think that's important. And I think until next February, uh, the conference, both of you will, uh, that both of you are organizing, I think there will be huge change even until that time. Uh, and another aspect that I don't know exactly when, but before that time, I will again, uh, most probably uh, hand in hand with the European Music Exporters Exchange that has been mentioned, that's EMI, which is the Music Exporters As Association of all the export offices. Uh, most probably we will try to again repeat uh, maybe a bit more uh, field focused discussion, uh, which is focusing either on licensing or label radio communication or live industry. So we will repeat this uh, later the year. And yeah, all I can say is thank you so much for uh, getting us a bit more acquainted to the, to the Indian global <laughs> music <laughs> system.